what makes a church plant? A church. If God's calling you to plant a church, you know that's more than just a worship service. You know that's more than just finding a building. A church is not an event you attend. A church is not a place you go. We don't go to church. And so if God's called you to plant a church, then what does that mean? And we hear phrases like mega churches and micro churches and house churches and all of those ideas have one word in common and that's church. Uh, you have a micro what? You have a mega what? Uh, in our house there's a something. Is that a church? And so we need to talk about what it is to have a working definition, a, an irreducible minimum understanding of who the church is. And so we have to begin there with who the church is, which is more than what the church does or where the church gathers. We should not be identified by what we do or where we meet, but who we are. And I think we find that here in scripture, and I wanna share some of that with you. There's an, a phrase in architecture called form follows function. And what that means is an architect will ask you, well, what's the purpose of the building? What's going to functionally happen within the walls of that building? And then they will develop the building, design the building based on the function. So in that moment, form follows function. So in that dynamic here, that would indicate that the definition of church follows the performance of the church. And I'm not sure that that's right. So I would wanna encourage a function follows form. In that dynamic, the definition of the church is fueled. It fuels how the church performs. So if form follows function, then the definition follows practices. But if function follows form, then the definition fuels the practices. And I wanna, I wanna have that conversation. Uh, who the church is. Now we can go back to Acts chapter two when it was first formed, and that's a, that's a great testimony there. There's some great irreducible minimums there in Acts chapter two. But some amazing things are happening there. Uh, these people have walked and talked with Jesus. They watched Jesus die on the cross. Uh, three days later, uh, they, they saw this resurrected Jesus, and then a month later, they watched him float up into the sky, and now they're just gathering, and what do we do now? And let's be devoted to some apostles' teaching, and let's break some bread and fellowship, and let's pray and there's this church 1.0 that was beautiful. And then you continue to move throughout the history and the pages and you get to pastoral epistles and some organizational principles and maybe church 2.0 and there might be some that go, man, I don't wanna jump into organization. I just wanna, I wanna stay organic at the beginning. And there's a lot of things to be learned from both. I think there might be something right in the middle of that, maybe a church 1.5. And I think we find that in the church at Antioch in the book of Acts. After the church's birth, they have some time to grow. There's some persecution and some things begin to change. And so I wanna share with you kind of an Antiochian ecclesiology that might help us identify some irreducible minimums of who the church is. So let's look in Acts chapter 11. I'm gonna begin reading in verse 19. It says, now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except the Jews. So now there's persecution happening. There's a scattering going on, and it's gone as far as uh, this area called Antioch. And what we're about to see is a church is about to be birthed in that area. And there are two primary marks that I want to share with you uh, as we develop a church planting ecclesiology from this. The first is this. The church is a people in community, a people in community, not a worship service, not a building, but a people in community. Throughout the rest of the pages of the New Testament, we see the church described as the family of God. So there's something about doing life together and being together and having community uh, that's beautiful. And we're going to see that here in Antioch and in some different uh, methods and models. And look what it says. It says, there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenist also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. So now we see kind of the first characteristic of this community. It was a people in community, and they shared these things in common. The first thing they shared was the Lordship of Jesus. They believed and turned to the Lord. There was a shared Lord in this community, Jesus. They were Jesus followers. They heard the gospel. By the way, this church was started with convert growth, just gospel being proclaimed in the community, and people came to know the Lord Jesus. And the church began under this 
gospel. And so they had a shared Lord, it was Jesus. But it also says that many believed and turned to the Lord. So not only is this people in community have a shared Lord, they also have shared beliefs. It's a, it's a church of believers, Christ followers, but also there are some bedrock beliefs. This, these are your, this is your doctrine and your theology. What do you hold to? What are some basic tenets of faith that you as a community are gonna hold to? They have a shared Lord. They had shared beliefs. And then it goes on. It says that the hand of the Lord was with them Many came to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad and exhorted them. So now the church in Jerusalem hears about this. And so they send Barnabas to go check it out. And so he sees a people gathered in Antioch. And these people, this community have a shared Lord and an understanding of the gospel. They have shared beliefs. And now he sees that they have shared values. There's something about them that he sees. It says he saw the grace of God on them. They were living out this gospel. There was clear evidence of the Holy Spirit working in them and through them in this community that Barnabas saw something in them, saw them living the gospel out, saw values that they were living out, and he said, that's the grace of God. That right there is evidence that the Holy Spirit is working in this place. And so this is where you need to have a conversation about developing some core values. It's about the gospel, a shared Lord, Jesus. Shared beliefs, what, what doctrines, what, what theology is going to be central for your early church? And now these core values, what is it gonna be about us living the gospel out uh, in life uh, that, that we will value and hold to, some core values? Then it goes on. It says that when he saw the grace, he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. So this people in community had a shared Lord, they had shared beliefs, they had shared values. Now they're going to have a shared mission or vision or purpose, whatever word that you're going to use for that. There's something that they were driven by. They, they had a common goal and a common aim, a common purpose. Whether it's a vision statement, a mission statement, a purpose statement, this is where you're going to put some pen to paper and write down what is it that we're going to be about. If I could put it into one statement, what would I say is our purpose, our mission, our vision? And so what is that for you in the early church? They had a, a shared purpose. Then it says that um, Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for a whole year, they met with the church and taught a great many people. So not only did they have a shared Lord and shared beliefs and shared values and a shared purpose, but now they also had shared worship. They gathered together. What you see repeated in that passage as well is a great number or many people. And they taught these people for a year. In Acts chapter 13, it says that they worshiped the Lord and they fasted together. So there's some sort of worship element here in this early church where they were taught the word of God, where they worshiped together, where they fasted and they prayed together. They shared worship together. And then something else innate within that passage is that Barnabas went and looked for Saul. Uh, they had shared leadership. Not only did they have a shared Lord, uh, a shared beliefs, shared values, shared purpose, shared worship. Now they have shared leadership. There's a team leading there. And it's this leadership piece that I really think is, is uh, the linchpin that really gives some identity to the church, how it's led that there was this plurality, that there were elders within this church that led the church. And this shared leadership was something that identified this early church. So first, they were a people in community, doing life together. They had a shared Lord. They had shared beliefs, shared values, shared purpose, shared worship, and shared leadership. But secondly, they were also a people in a community. Not only a people in community, life together, but they were also a people in a community, specifically in this one, in Antioch. This community was in Antioch. There's plenty of passages that talk about the church as the family of God, but there's also passages that talk about the body of Christ, the hands and feet of Jesus. The church was more than just a fellowship. It was a church on mission. They were, they were a people in a community. In this community, it was Antioch. And the church is a sent community. They were to be light 
in this. They were sharing the gospel. It continues to say that a great number of people were added to this place. More and more people each and every day because the church was sent to Antioch and people in Antioch heard the gospel, saw the gospel lived out and their numbers grew because they were there to be a sent light people. And so it says in Ephesians chapter three that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God is made known. There's something about the church. And by the way, in in verse 11, it says that this was according to the eternal purpose that's now been realized in Christ Jesus. It's been God's forever plan that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God be made known. We are a sent people, that's who we are. We are people in a community. And this people in Antioch were sent to be light in that community. But it also, we know that they were sent to be separate in that community. Not just to be sent, but to be separate. That passage ends with saying, and in Antioch, they were first called Christians. There's something about them that was different. We are to be holy, we are to be separate, we are to be distinct. And then in Antioch, this group was separate and distinct. And there's something about them that the community in Antioch said, those are Christians. There's something different about them. And so not only are we a sent people, we are to be a separate people. That's who we are. We are a people in community. We have shared Lord. It's Jesus all day. We have a shared beliefs. We have shared values. We have a a shared mission, vision, purpose. We have shared worship together and we have shared leadership. But we're also a people in a community and God is going to place you within a specific community to be sent to that community, to be light, but also to be separate, to be holy in that community. Let's go plant churches that meet these irreducible minimums of what it is to be called a church.